Thank you, Josh. <clears throat> and hello, everyone. I am so delighted to be with you this week as we approach the full moon of Shvat to Vishvat in just a couple of days. And as Josh said, we're going to be immersing in some earth-based Jewish spiritual practice, which you could argue, and we will discuss more this week, how all Jewish spiritual practice is earth-based. Um, as we prepare for and enter this beautiful holiday, the new year of the trees, which is really all about reinvigorating and reconnecting with our essential nature as earthlings. And with this wild and beautiful earthly world that we're a part of. And connecting with its wisdom, which can be such a profound source of vitality and nourishment and guidance when we can learn to align ourselves with it, to really listen to it and let it live through us as us without needing to or trying to resist it or control it too much. As my friend Rachel Rosenbluth says, we are often known as people of the book, us Jews, but really we are people of the garden. We are people of the garden, people of lands, of agriculture, of earthly rituals. And we find this back in the earliest moment that we have in our tradition, in our cosmological myth, our creation story in Breshit. Um, I'm going to just share my screen with you one moment. <clears throat> So this is a little source sheet I made for this week's practice, and you can find it. Um, Jet will put it in the chat. Right now, it only has today's sources on there. But so back here in the very beginning, embrace sheet, the first book of the Torah. It says, Vaitzer Hashem Elohim et Adam. So God formed Adam, the earthling, afar min ha'adama from the dust of the earth. And very often this word Adam is translated as the name of the first man, but it also means actually just earthling, Adam from Adama, so the human being from the dust of the earth. And in a sensual way here, we are earthlings created of the earth and that's in our very name, Adam. And later on in that same chapter, it says, Vaikach Adonai Elohim et ha Adam, Vayanichehu began Eden le Avda Shamra. So God placed Adam, the human being, began Eden in the Garden of Eden, le Avda Shamra, to it says here, it's translated as to till it. It could also mean to serve, la'avda, shamra, and to keep it, to guard it, to protect it. So both being of the earth, being earthlings, and also tending to, being in service of, and protecting this garden is an essential part of what it means to be human, perhaps an essential, the essential core of our purpose here on earth. And so this time of Tu Bishvat is a time of remembering this, of reconnecting with this essential truth of who and what and why we are so that we can become better stewards of this garden in greater connection to this earth. And we see this, um, this essential relationship reflected in our calendrical cycle, our calendar cycle, which is one of the greatest spiritual gifts and technologies that the Jewish tradition offers us. So our calendar and its cycle, it cycles through the holidays, through our stories, practices, and traditions are deeply rooted in seasonal and agricultural cycles. Any moment in the Hebrew calendar offers us physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual themes to connect with that resonate in some way with our earth and with the beings that share this earth with us. I'll show you this beautiful image of the Hebrew calendar. This is adapted from the Holistic Haggadah by Michael Kagan. 
um, and shared through the School of Living Jewishly. So this is our, our the cycle of our calendar. And you can see right here, we are over here in uh, approaching Tu B'Shvat with that theme of rebirth and rising sap. And we're right here at the end of winter time. So when we can open to the guidance that is here for us in any moment on our calendar, invite, inviting in those themes, we can connect in a deeper way to the collective experience that all living beings share on our planet. And from this, we are reminded that everything has its season, right? Everything has its season. Nothing blooms all year round. There is a time for blooming. There is a time for lying fallow, for the shedding, for the dying, for the releasing of what is ready to be released. And we live in a culture where very often fast and big and more and strong is celebrated and emphasized. So sometimes it feels like there's an underlying assumption that we should always be in bloom, right? We should always be flowering in our fullness. But the invitation here of living in this cyclical, seasonal and rhythmic way is to slow down to move at the pace of the earth, to learn from the living world around us, how our bodies and our hearts and our beings might actually be seeking to express themselves in this moment, perhaps in relation to the way that the earth is expressing herself. Is there wisdom in the lying fallow? Is there wisdom in the frozenness of winter in the waiting? in the way that water moves over rocks in a riverbank steadily and over many years, those rocks are impacted by the water. So again, here we are in this month of Shvat, approaching to Bishvat. And Shvat is a time of stillness and slowness as we are still in the winter. We're like right at the edge of winter time. And yet spring is stirring. The sap is beginning to rise in the trees. And so even right now in this moment, I invite you to see if you can connect with that energy of wintry slowness, the stillness. Is that present for you in some way, either inside of you or around you? The slowness of winter. And yet, is there also some new aliveness stirring within you? Some new vision, some inspiration. That rising sap. The so Tubishvat began as a legalistic day, a day when we would bring offerings of the new fruits that had just begun to bloom. So already, right, acknowledging our interconnectivity and that our abundance is meant to be shared. And later on, this holiday became a time of celebration. And then the mystics took it and created this beautiful Tubishvat Seder rooted in the Zohar by the 18th century. And the Tubishvat Seder, which is going to be the inspiration for the format of our week together over the next five days. The Seder is a ritualized way of reawakening our earthly interconnectivity with all of life on every level of our being. The Tubishvat Seder involves eating different kinds of fruit and guides us in contemplation and blessing through the four worlds of Kabbalah, which also correspond to the four directions and the four elements. Jill Hammer writes, the mystics who conceived the Tubishvat Seder imagined God as a tree. They imagined God as a tree with divine light running like sap through its branches. And they believed that eating a simple fruit could release sparks of divine light into the world. 
So as we journey through the four worlds on Tubishvat, which is also mapped onto our cosmological tree of life, we are releasing sparks of divine light. We're stirring, we're beginning to awaken from winter, connecting with our earthly nature, and in doing so, connecting to the divine. So here is an image that I created of the four worlds and their elements. The one in the very center here is an image of the Kabbalistic tree of life mapped onto Adam, a human. And here you have the four elements, which are the four worlds. So this week, we're gonna be moving through these four worlds, focusing on their elemental dimensions, the dimensions of earth, water, fire, and air, and the wisdom in those elements through connecting with our own embodiment of them so that we can experience ourselves as an integrated whole, physically, emotionally, intellectually, and spiritually in deep connection to the living world and its rhythms and cycles. That's what we're gonna be doing this week. And we're gonna be really focusing on embodied practice. One way that I really support my own connection to my body and the earth and my practice is sometimes having a mizbeach, an altar, a bit of a sacred space in the space where I practice. So if you're moved to this week, I invite you to join me in creating a, a mizbeach for you um, that can help to focus your energy with the elements represented. So you can see here at my desk this week, I have a, I have a candle for fire, a rock for earth, I have a feather and a little cup of water. So we can connect to these elements, not just through the computer screen or our imagination, but through their physicality, we're really landing in our bodies. And with that, I wanna invite us into our practice today, which is going to be a practice of noticing our interconnectivity with the living world and inviting in the wisdom of the tree, which is a role model for us in our tradition and a metaphor for our universe. So you can go ahead and settle into your body. Settling into a posture that is both relaxed and alert. just inviting the body to soften. Arriving a bit more fully here into the present moment, right here where life is happening. Nothing to do, nowhere to go. Just for now, letting go. Inviting the body to relax. With each exhale. And at the same time, feeling our alertness, feeling our wakefulness, perhaps that sense of uprightness in the spine. If you inhale, breathing in an energizing, nourish, nourishing breath. And exhale, softening, letting go a little bit more. Gently resting the attention, resting the mind here in the present moment. You might rest the mind and the breath. The sensation of the seat or the hands. It's resting the attention right here. in this embodied presence.
And as you settle in, become aware that your in-breath is the out-breath of the trees, plants, shrubs, and grasses that we share this planet with. Your in-breath is the out-breath of the trees. <clears throat> And as you breathe out, become aware that your out breath will become the in breath of the trees and the plants. Continue to observe your breath in this way, just gently inclining our awareness towards this vibrantly alive, interconnected oneness of being that we are a part of. this magnificent ocean of aliveness, connection, and life, love. Cycling through all of creation. Breathing in the out breath of the trees. Breathing out the in breath of the living world.
for the last few minutes of our practice, I invite you to bring to mind your favorite tree. Is there a tree that you feel connected to? Envisioning or imagining its roots. Its trunk. Its branches. Perhaps it's fruit. And you might even imagine yourself as this tree, connecting to your own sense of roots deep underground, anchoring you. Your sense of trunk, your spine, body, the uprightness. your branches, the ways that you reach and grow towards the light or offer shade to others. And your fruit. What has fruited in your life over the past year? What might be stirring in you to ripen in this coming year? We'll conclude our practice with a poem for Tubishvat from the Velveteen Rabbi. He writes, <clears throat> that's what Tubishvat is about for me. The sap of our hopes, the sap of our dreams, the sap that will fuel our work in the world. Imagine your feet planted in the earth like roots. Reach deep down into the earth and draw up the sustenance you need. With every beat of your heart, you can draw up more hope and more of the energy you'll need in order to create. On the outside, the world looks like winter, but in the heart of every tree, the first stirrings of spring are rising. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks so much. Um, hopefully you can see me. I can't see myself, and uh, but I'm, I'm doing my best. Here we go. All right, you can see me. Fantastic. So um, please um, uh, hang around. Uh, uh, if you can, and uh, we'll have a chance to reflect with Rebecca and have some conversation. Um, we're going to have an opportunity now for those who are um, reciting Kaddish to be able to uh, do so in memory of any loved ones that you are in holding in mind or heart. You can enter their name in the chat. That should be working now. Jet had to take off, so I'm doing this myself. So first time. Um, so you should be able to enter their name in the chat, I hope. And... Um, 
if that's working. Just give me a thumbs up if that's working because I know it's, there we go, it is working. And also then I'm going to uh, make it so that you can unmute yourself and we'll put um, Kaddish up on the screen. And if you'd like to join me in reciting Mourner's Kaddish, and do so. Amen. Amen. Hi. Hi, you just missed Kaddish. Hold up. There we go. <laughs> All right. There we go. Okay. So we got that. We got this. I think we have everything. So now if I bring Rebecca back and I spotlight her that should work of course i have to spotlight myself too okay anyway we'll figure it out i can't see myself for some reason but here we are um wonderful so hi rebecca uh this is th this is actually surprisingly a little harder than i expected thank you there we go it worked uh now we know why jet is so valuable uh <laughs> when you have to do this yourself so thank you so much. Um, anyone who needs to take off, uh, we wish you a farewell and join us back here tomorrow, same time channel for part two. Um, and uh, hopefully you can stick around uh, for a little bit. We'd love to hear um, a little bit more uh, about your own experience and your reflections. We can post also, there's been a request for the source sheet again. Um, and so we'll put that link back in the chat here. Do, 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 do. We'll repost that. Put it in here. Okay. Woo. Wonderful. Um, okay. So yeah, um, wonderful. Uh, and we'd love to hear about your about your own experiences with the practice today, Rebecca. I wonder if you just want to speak for a moment, just I think more generally about you know you started out with the notion that, you know, we, we often talk about like earth-based practices as though there's something else, mm -hmm. right? Like it's some sort of carve out, you know, um, in the same way that I now find myself talking about, like, it's not like there's mindfulness and there's Judaism, like Judaism is a mindfulness practice, right? And I think you're sort of arguing that Judaism is an earth-based practice. And I wonder if you just want to reflect about on that a little bit more, because I think it's also, especially, you know, you lead some of it, so much of our work with, with younger adults, um, and I feel like generationally, there's a real shift in the language that's going on here for a lot of people. So I just want to invite you to like reflect more, like amplify this Judaism is earth-based and just say like a little bit more about that. Yeah, thanks for that question, Josh. Um, also, just a side note before I go into that, somebody said Adama is translated as hummus. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so the translation you saw, it said... Um, that God formed the human from the soils, hummus. Or um, humus, maybe humus. Humus, not hummus. Yeah, humus. So that the word in Hebrew is afar min ha'adama, which really means dust of the earth. Afar min ha'adama. So that's so adama is earth. Afar is more the dust or the humus. 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 The, hum the humus. The humus. The humus, not the hummus. <laughs> yes, exactly. Anyway, the nurturing soil. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So that's your question, Josh. Thank you. Um, yeah, you know, and for that reason, I actually more often say the earth-based roots of Jewish practice rather than earth-based Judaism. 
And, and very often folks will say, what is earth-based Judaism, right? Judaism is earth-based. Or, or if folks actually aren't um, so familiar with the earth-based roots of Judaism, then I think that term earth-based Jewish practice or earth-based Judaism is useful. What we're really doing, just like with mindfulness, is we are emphasizing and elevating what is already so innate and fundamental to our tradition. And what we find when we look at our holidays, the vast majority of them, and um, many of our practices, and our um, certainly the themes of the months along the Hebrew calendar is that they are, as I spoke to already, deeply rooted in what's happening on the earth, both seasonally and in the agricultural cycles. Um, for me, it was, you know, it was really interesting how, I, like, I grew up in a conservative community in Texas where we built a sukkah every year and we shook a lulav, um, but we didn't really talk about the huge, like, prayers for rain that we were making. We didn't really talk about and think about how we're literally shaking a rain stick, these species of trees of the earth and a fruit of the tree. It wasn't until I found myself as an adult in a community that was really elevating and uplifting the earthy nature and the earth-based roots of Jewish practice where I started to think more and more importantly than think more than thinking, feel more into what that is to do such an earthly ritual as a human being in connection to land and in connection to what really um, brings us and provides for us brings us life. So our people, the ancient Israelites were completely dependent on rain as an agricultural people for their sustenance. So for them, that ritual of Sukkot and, and the praying for rain was not symbolic. It was deeply connected to their being able to live. And for us today, I think it all takes on new meaning. Um, obviously we live in a slightly different way than our ancestors or more than slightly a different way often than our ancestors and that direct dependency, but we're still directly dependent actually on our, on our natural cycles. And, um, maybe one of the consequences of often not living in such a, such a intact and direct earth connection is that it's, it's kind of easy to forget that. Um, and our job now is to remember because you spoke to the kind of generational differences. And I think one reason for why there might be a lot more folks in the younger generations, folks in their 20s and 30s and 40s, um, really being interested in, in earth-based spirituality and the earth-based roots of Judaism are one, one of those reasons is that we really feel the reality of the climate crisis, <laughs> the climate catastrophe, as it's now called, that we're facing in our lifetime and in the lifetime of our children and grandchildren. Um, so it's very real and the imperative to remember what it means to be Adam, min ha-adama, to be shomeret adama, to be guardians and tenders of the earth feels very real and very important. Yeah. 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 Beautiful. There's a lot of wonderful reflections that are coming in about uh, relationships with various plants and house plants and trees and um, yeah, just some beautiful reflections as always from from this community. Um, and there, there's a question here about resharing the link to the poem by um, I think it's Velveteen Rabbi, right, uh, Rachel Barenblatt. Um, or I think you just actually put the poem. You put the whole poem and yeah. Then, yeah. Um, so you can, uh, you can, you can put, put that in there. Um, and yeah, I'm just looking back up the, uh, the chat here, a lot of great things that are coming in. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that, I think what we're certainly, we know, like we're certainly seeing is just how, how important this seems to be. We know it's important, this, um, sort of awakening or reawakening to, this relationship with the natural world and with the earth and that, you know, our own bodies, our own, not, not just our bodies, our minds and emotions, our, our whole selves are just so deeply intertwined and that we've, it seems like as a community, you know, um, we and as a species, maybe we kind of forgot that, uh, at least parts of our species. 
um, in the in recent generations in terms of modernizing. Um, and now it's part of rediscovering it, right? And re and getting reacquainted. And yet this has been here all along. We've always had Tu Bishvat. You know, we've always had these holiday cycles um, uh, here for the to remind us of that. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, okay. There's a lot of gratitude that's coming in. Um, and these beautiful reflections about these trees. I'm reading Lori is here. I'm thinking about the beautiful, powerfully dependable willow tree that grew beside my growing up home in New Jersey, the home that my sibs and I currently are emptying now that mom has moved to a senior living facility after 62 years. This willow let me climb her each day and had a butt-shaped branch. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that helped me as I sat and wept or just found refuge from life. Um, that's beautiful. Really beautiful. Thank you. Um, yeah. And the, the ability to look, to, to, to be, to be part of, not just to look outside, but even to be part of outside. Yeah. I'm curious about your tree, Rebecca. What was, what, what's the tree that comes up for you? Yeah. I love that reflection. Um, Lori, thank you so much for sharing. It actually reminds me from in Brashit Raba in the Midrash, it says that all trees were created for human companionship and that they converse with humankind as well as with one another. And I totally relate to that experience of having a tree friend. <laughs> when I was a child, I also, I had a um, an oak tree in the backyard that I would just hang out with. And could really feel, really felt that the spirit of the tree really holding me. There's there's so much wisdom in in the trees, and we're, we'll get a lot more into that tomorrow. Um, when we go into earth and the tree being such a beautiful representation of earth. Um, and one thing I do want to add, Josh, to our previous the previous question is um, <clears throat> as far as for me personally, what draws me so in such a deep way to earth-based spirituality and relating to Judaism in that way um, is not just the imperative of the climate crisis and the kind of consequences of our living in such deep disconnection from the earth. It's also that there is such extraordinary wisdom in the natural world. And when we can connect to that brilliance and intelligence, it has so much to teach us about who we are and what we are and how to be and how to function. And it's an intelligence that is way beyond and actually like inconceivably greater than what our intellectual mind is capable of grasping. And our ancestors knew this, right? Our ancestors, if you read our Torah, they were actually not yeshiva students. They were actually not scholars, they were shepherds. They were people who lived in deep connection to the land and its cycles. And you know, our 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 um our literary tradition is such a hallmark and such a treasure. And it, and it it arose for a reason, right? We've been like a wandering people, kind of disconnected from our land. I mean, this is a whole other conversation that we won't get into, <laughs> but it's very important also the significance of our particular ancestral homeland and land in general. Um, but our our literary tradition arose for a reason. As, as wisdom that we could kind of bring with us wherever we went. And so for me, one of the questions is, what is possible now where for many of us, there is a relative groundedness and safety present, relative, right? That was different than in the past. What is the opportunity then of kind of reconnecting to land, to body, to the intelligence and information that's available to us? Um, when we can really be grounded and and at and at rest where we are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe there's one more time for one more question. And then we'll need to wrap up. But um, it says there's a question here from Pauline. In the Torah, we have a sort of linear narrative from Eden to at the end, what might be called an earned Eden. How does this connect with the seasonal cycle? That's a great question. Mm. A great question. That is a beautiful, beautiful question. So yeah, what is Gan Eden? <laughs> what is the Garden of Eden? What does it represent to us? Um, this is a beautiful question. I find it to be a very mysterious question and the Kabbalists certainly have a lot to say about it. I'll just share two thoughts that come up for me. 
One is there, there does seem to be this theme of like our origins being in Eden and that that's where we're returning to, right? Or that Eden is also associated with Alam Haba, associated with the energy of Shabbat, of presence, of safety, of peace, of beauty and delight. And um, two thoughts I'll share. One um, related to Tu Bishvat. So our mystics teach that the tikkun, the repair, the healing that is available to us this week of Tu Bishvat is the tikkun of eating, of how we, you know, if you think about it, eating, where we're, we're intaking food that grows upon the earth, that is like a literal way in which we are embodying our interconnectivity with the earth. And so a lot is happening there. And of course, we have a lot of rules and laws and ways to bring consciousness to that process. Um, so our, our mystics teach that Tu Bishvat, on Tu Bishvat, there's a special opportunity to engage in a real healing with how we intake, how we consume um, food, how we embody and relate to our natural world. So that's that's one thought that this holiday and 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 that um that tikkun that repair of eating actually is connected to the the part of our story that takes place in the Garden of Eden where Adam and Chava where Adam and Eve eat from the tree of life. So there is a way in which on this holiday we are connecting to the Garden of Eden and our journey kind of back towards that consciousness through eating and through consumption. That's one spark of inspiration it can lead you with. And another one, one of the one of the ways in which Gun Eden has become um or one contemplation that I've really been bringing to it is is the way that the root of the word Eden is is the same root as uh gentle gentleness. So how might bringing gentleness into our practice, into our direction, our kavana for our spiritual life also help us connect to the consciousness that is available to us in that, in that metaphor, in that part of the story. All right, there's more, there's a lot more to do. Uh, plenty more to reflect on and study. Thank you so much, Rebecca. This is so great to have you here all week. Um, I want to encourage you to come back tomorrow whenever you can join us at our regular time. Um, and we're going to wrap up now, but thank you to everybody for being part. And thank you to Rebecca for um, this beautiful teaching and uh, holding such beautiful space today. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you back here tomorrow or whenever you can join us. Take care. Thanks, everyone.